the human being that emerges from psychoanalysis is not a human being that is at peace with itself. It is a human being that is divided, split, that is in conflict with itself and that doesn't know itself. Completely. There is a kind of, uh, in a way, a new vision of what it is to be human that emerges through psychoanalysis, which recognises conflict as fundamental. Freud's fundamental view of humans is that they are incessantly at war with themselves, inside their own mind. So that model of conflict and of division within, of a sort of fractured self, is fundamentally important. Freud has Freud two models. In the first model, he distinguishes between perception consciousness, what he calls the pre-conscious and the unconscious. In the second model, he distinguishes between the ego, the id, and the superego. The id refers to the um, cluster of drives that push for immediate satisfaction. It's governed by the pleasure principle. It wants things here and now, regardless of the consequences. And if it doesn't get it, then it screams or has a tantrum. So if the id's associated with the drives and with getting satisfaction, however, in whatever form, um, then, then the ego has to, to sort of deal with that and say, you can't do it that way, but maybe you can do it this way. It's a sort of negotiating agency. And, and then you've got the superego on the other side, which is to do with conscience and, and law, which says, no, you know, no, you can't try and do anything ever. You've got to be perfect. You've got to be all right. And so the ego's got to sort of mediate that too. It's about how to make the, these two, the sort of the law and the drives, how, how to make that livable. One of the difficulties in the later model of ego, id and superego, uh, and one of the reasons why it doesn't just map onto the earlier model of conscious, unconscious, preconscious, is that Freud thought that a part of the ego was also unconscious to itself. So there could be, as it were, something going on in the ego that's repressing thoughts, and yet that very fact or that very process might be unconscious within the ego. He thought of the ego a split between a conscious and an unconscious part. And then he also realised that when, as a result of identifications with our parents, we form ideals that we want to, uh, to match, you know, ideals of ourselves, these agencies are not all conscious so that the unconscious is actually spread over the whole area of the mind. Sometimes I think we can oversimplify it by thinking about these sort of three little uh, figures running about in our minds. The it represents normal um, childish desires and pleasures and to demonize those by calling it a devil, I don't think is a good idea. And with the, e the superego as an angel, I think it's even more problematic because many of the demands of the superego are quite tyrannical and nonsensical. People talk about it as conscience, a kind of internalized version of conscience, but that makes it sound rather sanitized. So one of the, the features of the superego is that it seems to be the voice of conscience, of morality, but it's actually a passionately sadistic and hating 
voice in my ear telling me what to do. You know, the idea of the superego being something quite potentially perverse, that, that it's an agency that can even get enjoyment from making the person suffer, from watching them fail to live up to an ideal, for instance. What Freud is, was saying was that people fall ill of their moral ideals. And we ought to question their moral ideals. But the superego is um, sort of built out of the orders and the instructions and the diktats and the words of, of your primary carers and, and you should and you shouldn't and you must and you mustn't, etc. And so, so the kind of wo exact words and beliefs and ideals of your parents are what your superego is built out of. Let's take an example. Take a person who a man who, whose job was outside in the street, say he was uh, a merchant at a, at, at a market store. He uh, developed panic attacks when going into work, and in, only in the summer. And in the end, he couldn't go into work at all in the summer. What emerged in the analysis was that he was told, as a young boy, when he became interested in, in girls and used to look, you mustn't stare at a woman. Now, in the summer, a lot of um, slightly clad, very pretty young women, uh, girls came to his market stall and he found it impossible not to look. So to fulfill this um, moral demand of the superego, of which he wasn't aware, not initially, um, all he could do in the end was to avoid the situation completely. So you know, he was unable to work um, because of his strict superego. If people have a, a sort of moral ideal that, that doesn't enable them to live, then, then they're going to suffer. In, in a way, any symptom, any psychological symptom, would be an example of the ego breaking down. So, you know, whether it's a, a phobia or an obsession with hand washing or an inability to, to go to work or a depression. Or... All those things are signs that the ego just isn't coping and isn't managing to find a suitable compromise. The second model of the mind that Freud came up with, the one that distinguishes between the ego, the it and the superego, which also became the most popular one, has advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages, and I think Freud himself noticed that towards the end of his life, is that it gives pride of place to the ego. Freud draws the analogy between a horse and a rider and the ego and the id. The id is a horse, you know, a strong animal, full of energy, and um, the rider tries to rein in the horse, to direct it along a pathway that the rider chooses. And you know, more often than not, say, that works. However, sometimes the horse has a mind of its own and it chooses its own way. And the ego, a rider, just follows. Um, and pretends that it's going where it wants to go, where it's the horse that's making the decision. And this gives us a bit of a problem with the ego, because our egos are often giving us a false idea about who we are and what we can see. The ego is always a bit of a hokey construction. It's always a bit silly. It's always, you know, just trying to make everything okay and make everything look good. It's a bit like politicians saying, we don't want to be seen to da 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 da. You know, they don't mind actually doing it. They don't want to be seen to do it. The ego is something a bit like that. So some of the things that the ego might bring when someone comes is a story about themselves. A typical one would be, I had a very happy childhood. My uh, mother and father got on very well. It's a story that, with a question, may uh, prove to not be the whole story. 
and it's the ego, its job has been to censor some of these darker aspects of people's lives. There's no idea of propping up the ego, it's just, you know, stop the ego being so silly, stop it being such a politician and be a bit more realistic about the fact that you might want to do bad things, you might fail to live up to your ideals, it might be very difficult to be human, but try with that and stop trying to be a robot.